My name is Garth Davis. I'm a medical doctor. I am the medical director for the Houston Methodist Center for Weight Management and Bariatric Surgery. I went plant-based after doing a life insurance policy test and finding out I've got very high cholesterol and hypertension. Uh, this was right when my first child was being born, um, and that was 15 years ago. And it's been kind of an evolution. I don't even know how long I've been vegan. Um, probably at least 10 years, I would guess. So um, 15 years plant-based, 10 years vegan is probably roughly where it is. How do you distinguish the two? Oh, because you could be, you know, at, at first I was pescatarian and some, you know, cheese here and there. And uh, then eventually I got to the point where I was like, you know, no animal products. Okay, so what made you go plant-based and then what made you go vegan? So what made me go plant-based was health. I went plant-based because my LDL cholesterol was through the roof and I was hypertensive and overweight. How did you know that would work? Well, you know, funny, so I, I went and got the studies done that showed that I had high cholesterol and hypertension. And my first instinct as a doctor is to go and see a doctor. And so I go to my buddy and, hey, these are my numbers. What do you think? You know, it, it's funny how it is in medicine. We're so used to seeing disease now that we almost expect people to get this. So it's kind of like, oh, yeah, your cholesterol's high. No big deal. I'm going to put you on a statin. And I'm like, God, don't statins have side effects and stuff over time? Yeah, but don't worry about that. If you get a you know, side effect, we'll switch you to this and we'll do that. And, you know, there's this whole kind of uh, thing you go through. It's like you, you almost start to expect that over time you're going to add medications to your life and this is going to be a lifelong process. And something in me said, wait a second, does it have to be like that? Like, why are we like this? And is everyone in the world like this? And the more I learned that, well... You know, in America, we're only 5% of the world's population, but we're 75% of the world's prescription drugs. That's a crazy figure, and why is that? And so the more I studied it, the more I started to realize, well, this is a dietary problem. Uh, you look at blue zones, you look at parts of the world where they've done migration studies from, you know, Japan to America, and how does that affect heart disease? Is, and you looked at all this to go plant-based. Yeah, I looked at all of this, you know, I looked at all of these studies to finally say, you know what? The more plants I eat, the more fiber I eat, the less meat, dairy, and eggs I eat, the better off my health's gonna be. Veganism isn't about health to me. I mean, veganism was something else. So you start going plant-based and you start realizing this is good for your body and soul. But then you start looking a little bit further, like, you know, what is the meat that we eat and where does it come from? And you start learning about that and you start thinking, God, it might be a little bit hypocritical for me to love my dog, but be totally fine to kill a chicken. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at a cute little lamb at a petting zoo with your little kid and then ordering lamb uh, at dinner. And you start to say, eh, this was the lamb that I just was petting with my kid thinking it's just like my dog. And these kind of connections, uh, then of course you start getting into, uh, you know, agribusiness and what they do, it's just horrible. And uh, what goes into these meats, uh, you know, from a chemical standpoint, and then what is this doing to our environment? So uh, I started to develop like this kind of like concept around food is that food had, to, food had to fulfill three things for me. Number one, it had to be healthy. Obviously not all the time, because I'm gonna eat some junk food from time to time. It, it, it's also impossible to get food with no harm whatsoever but it had to minimize the amount of harm that went into animals to get it. Even our salads harm animals because there's rodents in the, in the fields and stuff like that. But I had to do my best to buy local, uh, do my best to uh, not you know, contribute with my dollar towards an industry that just tortures animals. Um, and then the third thing would be to do my best to make sure that the foods I eat contributes to uh, a sustainable environment as best possible, or at least the least damage to the environment. So 15 years ago, cholesterol's crazy, and you go plant-based because of the science. So over that course of five years, you start realizing these other things, the ethics, the environment. 15 years ago, was there a, another alternative, like a carnivore or a keto option that you could have considered? So 15 years ago, there was definitely Atkins, right? I mean, they didn't really call it keto diet back then. It was Atkins diet. And I had done Atkins diet before. I was, I was overweight. Um, and so I had done Atkins before, uh, probably 
jacked my cholesterol up like crazy, but I just didn't check it at the time. It's so crazy that you could do that diet and think it's somewhat healthy. I was going, because at the time I was a resident and uh, I worked in a hospital that had a Wendy's in the hospital. You know, the ultimate irony uh, here, are these patients with, you know, IV poles ordering their double cheeseburgers. And I love double cheeseburgers from Wendy's, love them. And so I would order a double cheeseburger, but just hold the bun as if the bun was the crime. Uh, eggs and bacon for breakfast, I thought it was the greatest diet ever, but you know, so horrible for you. You feel terrible uh, in essence with it. But that was really the alternative. There just wasn't a lot of talk about it. It's like, it's amazing to me now where I look at all disease in a background of lifestyle. Back then, I didn't look at any disease as a background of lifestyle. I looked at it as genetic or just inherent in the human condition. Uh, it's inherent in the human condition that we develop diabetes, uh, just bad luck. Inherent in the human condition that you have a predisposition to high cholesterol, that you're gonna develop heart disease, just bad luck. That was my view back then. So. How long did you do the Atkins? Um, oh boy, I probably did it for a few months, lost a few pounds because you're not that hungry when you do it. And you also, Atkins, uh, <laughs> keto too, the big trick there is that you lose weight, but most of that weight is water weight. And in fact, people don't know this because they think they're eating high protein on that. You actually lose a lot of muscle too. You think, oh, you step on a scale, the numbers goes down, this diet is working. It's not really working. Um, we, we've got now good ward studies. Kevin Hall did a great study where he took people, I don't know who volunteers for these things, uh, but he put them on a keto diet in a hospital setting where they can measure every little variable, make sure they give them the right you know, amount of carbs, etc. Um, and he saw, in fact, that you know, a lot of the weight loss is, in fact, water. Uh, and if not water, some um, muscle. And did you try anything else besides that? No. I mean, you say to yourself, I'm just going to eat healthier, but you know that I'm going to do moderation. Uh, but you know, it's not that I really felt, I mean, when you think back about it, I, I didn't really, I mean, I knew when I was eating, well, I didn't. So I knew when I was eating completely unhealthy, right? I knew if I'm going to McDonald's, that's not healthy. But a lot of my diet I thought was healthy. I thought it was healthy to have eggs for breakfast. I thought chicken was fine. I thought a steak was good for me, you know, build my muscles, uh, which I didn't really have back then. It was hard for me to say, oh, I've got high cholesterol, this is my diet causing it, because I didn't really think in those terms. Okay, so you go plant-based and your numbers improved. Dramatically. Your weight improved. My weight improved, my numbers improved, the way I felt. I had really bad irritable bowel syndrome. I mean, my stomach was horrible. Uh, and that got better very quickly. Uh, the higher fiber diet was just like, oh my God. That was probably the biggest first thing that I noticed was like. Was that right away? That was pretty quickly. Within a few weeks, I was like, God, my stomach feels better. Um, that was a pretty dramatic change pretty quickly. So we know there was a great study um, in nature where they put a group of people that were meat eaters on a plant-based diet and watch their microbiome completely change in two weeks and then put them back on meat and it completely changes. And so I think I was probably going through that microbiome change. Cholesterol levels plummeted, which I was really interested in. And I became uh, very uh, introspective of like how I feel when I eat, you know, before I would eat and just be like, oh, I feel horrible. Uh, oh my God, I ate too much. Now I would eat and I felt great. And I was like, wow, you really feel great eating this way. I started looking at all kinds of variables too. My C-reactive protein went down, which is a measure of inflammation. I was looking at my triglycerides. I was looking at my uh, A1C levels. That was never high, but you know, I, I looked at my insulin level. My insulin level was a little bit high. And that means I was on the beginning of insulin resistance and that went down. Um, I got real, I started saying, well, I want to check everything. So I got kind of like specialized blood work um, looking at like, you know, if I'm eating this way, what are my amino acid levels? And they were fine all the way through my diet. <laughs> One thing that did show up though was that my mercury level was really high because I was, in the beginning, I was pesco vegetarian. So I was eating fish. You know, I called the lab and wanted to speak to the, the person who ran the lab. And I was like, so, 
my mercury level's 25, what's normal? And he's like, well, I mean, technically normal should be zero. And I was like, zero? And mine's 25? So that was the end of fish. Um, and then of course, when you start looking at what we're doing to the oceans with fishing, which is just horrible, uh, I, I just didn't want any fish anymore. So fish has completely stopped. Anything else between the time you went plant-based and vegan that you noticed or did? The pescatarian dropped pretty quickly when I got the mercury levels. Then it was kind of just this noticing that I didn't feel well with dairy. Dairy was an insult. Because the one thing that was hard for me to give up was pizza. And remember, this is back, we're back, you know, 15 years ago. There wasn't all these, like, you know, vegan cheeses and vegan meats and stuff like that. If I wanted a pizza, it was bread with tomato on it, right? I mean, it was like, there was, and some vegetables, but the vegetables wouldn't stick very well. I would always call Domino's Pizza and order a pizza without cheese, and it would, like, it just became like just a mush of stuff on top of, you know, cheese kind of holds things in place. So this would, like, you know, just, so we didn't have many options, right? So I, pizza was my thing, but I always felt terrible when I ate the pizza. Um, I just never felt good eating the pizza. And so I was like, yeah, this cheese is really probably the last thing that's gotta go. Did you notice any physiological, mental, or emotional changes after going vegan? Yeah, going vegan, it was just a kind of a continuous, like, oh, okay, I feel even better. Now dairy's out of the system, and dairy was probably a big contributor. My cholesterol dropped even more. Now I'm down to normal levels. After I dropped dairy, I went down to completely normal. What's normal? Well, you really want to be less than 100. My last was like 78, no medicines. You're not talking about total cholesterol, right? No, you're talking about LDL cholesterol. Yeah, okay. All right, so... All right, and then, so going vegan made it even go lower. Yeah, it made it go lower. I felt better. My energy levels, you know, just continued to do well. And then I started getting into athletics because I was like, God, I feel so good. I always, you know, I would drive by someone running, and I'd be like, that guy is a lunatic. What's he doing? That's horrible. And, you know, I would just work my, you know, very busy job and come home and just lay on the couch uh, because that's all I had the energy for. But after this, all of a sudden, I was like, I've got all this extra energy all of a sudden. And so for a while, everything I was concentrating on was diet, but then I turned to exercise and really started getting into running, which was like a miracle to me. And then I got into triathlons and I was like, I can't believe I could do this. Uh, I never thought this was ever possible. And I started gaining muscle, which for years I tried to gain muscle and just couldn't gain muscle. And now I'm like gaining muscle easily. So, you know, there was this continuous like getting healthier and healthier and healthier and feeling better and better and better. Now, your day job as a bariatric surgeon, in my mind, as a, you know, a vegan, I'm like, well, why would he do that? <laughs> why would he do that? Yeah, so in the beginning, it did, you know, discovering veganism did make me kind of question my job because, yeah. you know, these people are coming in and they're, they're eating how I used to eat. Uh -huh. And so I just want them to eat the way I'm eating now. And so that became a big focus of mine. Like, let me see if I could get people not to need surgery. But the success rate in that was low. My father kind of challenged me at the time. He was my partner, so we, we worked together. And he was like, he thought it was malpractice for me to not do the surgery. And to explain why, if you look at the data with weight loss surgery in morbidly obese patients versus morbidly obese patients that don't get weight loss surgery, the weight loss surgery extends life, extends quality of life, is the best treatment we have for diabetes hands down. And so he thought for me to take a morbidly obese patient, tell them that there's some other way other than surgery when the evidence doesn't show that this diet could do what surgery could do. You have to understand that like a morbidly obese patient, this is really a disease process. It's not, you got to walk a mile in their shoes. I was overweight. I was not morbidly obese. You get to a morbid obese status, and there's other things going on. There are hormones controlling hunger. There are factors having to do with metabolism. There are genetic factors. There's socioeconomic factors. There's psychological factors, past traumas, all these kind of things that could drive people to eat. And telling them you got to eat this way without affecting those factors isn't going to work. It doesn't work. It, it, it's been shown over and over again. And so what surgery became for me was a tool to help them change towards a healthier diet.
because they just weren't doing it when I was putting them on the diet alone. Now, I still do medical diets. Some people come in and they don't want surgery at all, and we work on the diet, and we do a good job, but now I'm using medicines to be that tool to help them make the changes. Um, there's some people that obviously don't have all these issues, and they will just get it, and they don't need medicine, they don't need surgery, and they lose the weight. And that, that is obviously a huge win when that happens. Um, but I gotta tell you, when it comes to people in that morbid obese category, those wins are few and far between. Most people want a tool or need a tool in order to make the changes. Now you talked a lot about that in your talk on Saturday, and I'll probably put a link to that in the description, but you also showed some data there, and that was really cool. But there was a point where I felt like when you were emphasizing that surgery is the most effective thing. I was a little confused about that. I had to remind myself, you're talking specifically, you're qualifying specifically that this person is morbidly obese. Morbidly, we wouldn't do somebody. surgery on just someone who's a little yeah. bit overweight. So yeah. we're talking body mass index above 35, usually above 40. So, I mean, you know, you're talking people 250 to 300 to 400 pounds. Um, so you're not talking about, you know, someone who's 180 and needs to lose a little bit of weight for summertime bikini season this is like and these people have serious medical illnesses they've got diabetes they've got hypertension they've got osteoarthritis they can't walk they can't move because they've been overweight for so long most of these people have been overweight since they were kids um you know most if you're an obese child you're going to be an obese adult and there's about an 80 percent chance you'll be an obese adult um and so they've been overweight forever um and it's just they've developed all the complications of obesity by the time they got into my office now, a lot of these chronic diseases, though, for people that aren't morbidly obese, a lot of these could be prevented with a plant-based diet? Um, a plant-based diet is excellent and helps. I, I do think not everybody is going to be cured with a plant-based diet. So it, it, they're in, the, in my beginning, in my initial, you know, just zeal over, like just my, my initial, like, oh my God, this plant-based diet is amazing and it worked so great for me. My thought was, it's got to work for everybody. And that just didn't turn out to be the case. There would be someone with hypertension. Oh, I'm going to cure this with a plant-based diet and it wouldn't be cured. Oh, I'm going to cure your diabetes with a plant-based diet and it wouldn't be cured. Um, for, m m there's a lot of people that it is cured for. There's a lot of people Everybody gets better with a plant-based diet than where they were, um, but it's, it's not going to be the end-all cure. It's, uh, there are going to be people that still need medical help. Mm -hmm. Because I can only imagine now in the comment section, people like, well, if they went carnivore. Yeah, I mean, the carnivore thing's just stupid. I don't know. That's, like the, that, that's just dumb. Uh, I, I don't even know. I don't even know why we talk about the carnivore. I, I feel like we're giving them more attention than they. They've got zero evidence. I mean, it's zero studies, zero, none, nothing. There's no uh, randomized controlled trial of carnivore versus this or that. And the the concepts are just so stinking stupid that it's anti-intellectual to even discuss it. Anybody who who could tell you with such confidence that they're correct without any science behind it, you know, you'll notice like with what I'm talking to you right now. I think a plant-based diet is amazing for your health. I think it could cure a lot of diseases. It could certainly make diseases better, but I'm not going to say it's going to prevent you 100% from getting heart disease or cancer or all these kind of things. Because there's nuance in this, and I recognize the nuance, and most of the good plant-based doctors recognize the nuance. There are other plant-based doctors that are like, oh my God, it'll cure everything. But the good plant-based doctors recognize the nuance. The carnivore guys are like, Eat nothing but meat, and even if your LDL cholesterol's through the roof, you're going to live forever. The dumbest thing I've ever seen. And there's a, there's a great, there's a, uh, a person, um, Carnivore Cringe on Instagram, and she goes into their, like, uh, to their Facebook pages and their Instagram pages and, like, copies what they're talking about and puts it on Instagram. And it's hilarious. They're all like, I don't understand why my cholesterol is going high and I'm gaining weight even. I just ate, all I eat is butter and, and steak. I don't understand why I feel so sick. You know, it's just so dumb. It's, it's so dumb. I, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Well, I, I know, and I hate, we, I hate we have to go there, but it's really, I feel like their last-ditch effort after the failed Atkins, the paleo, the keto, and now, you know, even the Weight Watchers. And, and now we have 
the, I mean, what's left? I mean, they could, they, they could reframe it into lion diet, but that's kind of the same thing, right? Have you heard of the lion diet? I haven't heard lion. It, it's also dumb to me. They all, it's just renaming the same thing over and over. I mean, carnivore is even stupider just because there's like no fiber and they think fiber is bad for you, even though there's like, there's so much science at the benefit of fiber. Like, so it's like, I'm just this, I mean, I actually was going to write a book on fiber years ago and I started going through the science. Like, this is too much. I was like, it's going to take me forever to synthesize all of this information into a book. Um, I, I had enough with protein. Fiber was going to be too much. And now people have written some good books. Um, fiber, fiber Fuel is a great book. Um, and so, uh, uh, I mean, the evidence for the benefit of fiber is huge. And they're saying fiber is bad for you? Yeah, I, and I, I literally was just responding to comments about this today in, in the comment section under an oncologist video. Um, yeah, and... And if you do some research, you could look. I mean, there's the cancer.org, American Cancer Society. I mean, they're, American they're, Institute of Cancer Research yeah, is a lot on it. It's yeah, just dumb. They're, it's like, all, they're all saying eat more fiber. Everybody says Institute that. Institute of Medicine. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's no one that says they're not even the healthiest people in the world. Eat lots of fiber. I mean, fiber, uh, there was, you know, great studies. I mean, this has been going on for years. You go back to uh, Dr. Dennis Burkett, who was a general surgeon in London, and you know, he noticed that there was a population of people from Uganda and London and the, the same disease processes that the Anglo-Saxons had. So he went to Uganda for many, many years and studied the Ugandans trying to figure out what is it about a Ugandan in their natural environment versus a Ugandan in a Western environment. The answer he came up with was fiber. And that answer has, you know, held true for many years for many different disease processes. Now, some, some people bring up an interesting point. So say you got to go in for, to get a colonoscopy and they, they make you not eat any fiber. Or if you have diverticulitis or polyps or whatever, they make you omit fiber for a little while, while you're healing. They shouldn't do that. So what, what they do, there's this, it's so dumb. Uh, so diverticuli are little out pouchings from the colon. And there's this thought process that like, pieces of nuts and seeds could get in there and block it off and cause completely not true. If you have diverticulite, you could totally eat that stuff. If someone's got Crohn's disease and they actually have a stricture, that's the one time you don't want to eat a lot of fiber because they've got a blockage in their intestine and that stuff's not going to get through. The bulk's not going to get through and they need to. So there's a lot, there's some excellent studies on the benefits of plant-based diet for inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's. But those studies are done with people with Crohn's in remission. If you have an active stricture where that food can't get through there, that's a problem that needs to be solved first before you start doing a high bulk diet. Had they had a high fiber diet prior to that, probably wouldn't have ever, ever had the problem to begin with. No, Maybe. again, that's a over-exaggeration of the, the, so that's the, the, you know, we can't say a plant-based diet would prevent all Crohn's forever. We just can't say that. But we've got pretty good studies that people on a plant-based, if you go from, if you've got Crohn's in remission, so you don't have any strictures, they did a study in Australia, I think it was, and they took a group of people with Crohn's, regular diet that they were on before, and a group of people with Crohn's, plant-based diet. And I believe in the plant-based diet, I can't remember how many people were in it, only one person got a reoccurrence of their Crohn's, but in the regular diet group, like 96% got a recurrence. So keep in mind, if it's 96%, 4% of people, and I would have to look at that study specifically to get the exact numbers, but for the, let's say it was 96, and then, so four people were eating their junk food and they didn't get a recurrence. Meanwhile, there was some plant-based person who was like, I ate plant-based and I got a recurrence. You guys are wrong. But when that's the problem you know, with, it, with research, you got to look at all these variables and understand that there is no 100% of anything. Anybody tells you 100% anything, they're wrong. Uh, and that's what you hear from these carnivore guys. We are 100% sure, even though we've got zero, and uh, they get it. Look, I mean, look, we've got a, you know, a game show president who would do the same thing. We have a very loose uh, kind of association with truth these days. I mean, there's this like, uh, like uh, almost facts don't matter anymore. Science doesn't matter anymore. It's really weird, but. You know, I like to point out that it's not a panacea as well. Whenever I'm talking to people in the comment section, 
because I'm a layman, but you know, it's my understanding there, there isn't any, but the totality of evidence supports this. Before we drift away from the carnivore thing, I did interview a PhD in nutrition recently, and she, she calls it a, an elimination diet, basically, where you're getting rid of these processed foods, and, and now you're seeing transient results, and we still don't know, though, the long-term efficacy, if it's gonna be detrimental to health span or not. So the carnivore diet, is that an elimination diet in your... Oh, yeah. That, I mean, she makes a good point in that regard. So someone goes on a carnivore diet, they're like, I feel great. Well, before they were eating complete crap. And one of the worst things you could do is take a simple carb and mix it with a fat. That's like the worst thing you could do. So they are right that it is probably better if you're going to take those fats to not have simple carbs with them. Because... This is kind of complex. I don't know how complex you want to Glycation? get Glycation? Is that what you're doing? Glycation is part of it. The other part of it is every cell in our body runs on carbohydrates. Every cell. It's a lock and key mechanism, right? So there is something called the GLUT4 receptor, which think of that as the lock. Insulin goes to that lock. It unlocks the door and the carbs get in. The problem comes when fat gets into that lock. So if I'm going to do a study on insulin resistance, if I just infuse fat into someone's vessel, they immediately, one meal, one fatty meal, and I could show increase in insulin resistance. And in fact, in Kevin Hall's studies on keto versus vegan diets where he kept people in a hospital setting, the people on the low-carb keto diet had more insulin resistance because fat blocks that. Now it takes more insulin to open that door. So now it's harder to get the carb in. So if you're, if you're combining fat with carb, you're gonna get transient rises in carbohydrates and more insulin response and you know a, a cascade of bad things. So yeah, I mean, someone eating a cheeseburger who goes from a cheeseburger to a grass-fed steak is gonna do better and feel better. Uh, there's no question. Um, but they could feel even better if they ate the way we did because I'm I, like now my, my cells are just, they fly open. So if I eat a carbohydrate, you know, I feel great. I feel energetic because all our cells are working on it. Um, they're, in a, you know, over time, they're going to have the LDL cholesterol levels. They're going to get uh, inflammatory issues. I mean, seeing these guys walk around with a LDL level of 500, it's like insane that they could do this and like not be scared because they've got no science whatsoever to back that that's safe. And they're like, well, I'm alive now. That's the, that's like the stupidest thing ever, right? This takes time. It's not like you, you know, I mean, come see me in 10 years. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get ourselves healthy for 10 years from now, not right this second. Somebody commented about Steve Jobs, you know, and of course, Dr. McDougall already set the record straight on that. I mean, these things do take time. I mean, cancer could have started early in life, you know, and people well, the, are caught up in the moment. And, yeah, they, I mean, Steve Jobs, first of all, he did a ton of drugs. I mean, who knows what drug he might have done that could have caused cancer. Uh, who knows what environment he was living in with those, you know, with all the computers and what kind of effects that had. The other thing is he went on really bizarre diets. I mean, that's not what... Didn't he go on like an all-carrot diet or something like that? I mean, I see a lot of vegans are like, I went vegan and then I dropped it because I felt terrible. And I'm like looking at their YouTube and it's like, I'm on a fast right now. I'm on a juice fast. I'm on a juice cleanse. I'm on a this cleanse and a that cleanse. I'm like, this is just ridiculous. This isn't what a whole food plant-based diet entails. It's not these crazy extremes. Um, and the other thing I see people do is go on like, they go on a plant-based diet, yet they're still portion controlling. So you eating like a tiny salad. And you're like, oh my God, I'm hungry all the time on a plant-based diet. Of course you are. I eat a big gigantic bowl for lunch, you know, uh, because, you know, there's a low calorie density to my food. So, you know, people make these mistakes and then they blame. You can't, you can't blame any one person's experience on their diet. It, it, it's crazy. It's like you can't, and N of one is stupid. My grandmother did this and my grandmother ate, my grandmother ate steak like crazy and died at 90. You can't take any N of one. We're looking at big, huge population statistics. And is there a relative increase in the risk of early mortality with a certain diet? And is there a relative decrease with another diet? That's what we got to look at. Um, and it's possible that while my grandmother lived to 90, she could have lived to 100, you know? So just taking an N of one is useless. Mm -hmm. And as far as like 
the uh, observational research, I mean, we have a lot of different observational research in, that's showing the more plant-based, the better outcomes, right? But then we also have more rigorous stuff too, right? Yeah, I mean, the more there's not a lot of great pure plant-based studies because it's really hard to do that. I mean, there's not there are some vegan database or vegans in a database like the Epic Oxford database. Um, now you look at those vegans and they're not the healthiest vegans, right? So when you start looking at some of the things, their fiber content was really low. Um, you know, you know, I, I want to interject there. The you know, in my mind, a lot of those might have been more ethical vegans. Because, they were ethical you vegans. Know, in the beginning, it yeah. was just purely yeah, ethical. Yeah, so this vegans. was back when they were only doing it for ethical reasons. They weren't eating very healthy. They weren't supplementing. So there was like B12 deficiencies. If there's a B12 deficiency, that increases your homocysteine. But yet, they still had lower of certain cancers and lower heart disease. Uh, and there was like one study. Well, they had higher hemorrhagic stroke. I mean, it was like the, the absolute risk was minuscule. Um, and so that was the EPIC database. The other big database where we've seen really positive responses to vegan, and it's got to be the best data, database when we're looking at vegans, is the Adventist Health Study, because it is the largest population that we have of vegans. And the interesting thing about the Adventist Health Study, it, they did, the Adventist Health Study started because Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, don't smoke. It's against the religion to smoke. People in Palo Alto, right next to Loma Linda, did smoke. And so it was a great first study to look at how does smoking affect lung cancer. But they were noticing that, like, wow, these people in Loma Linda, California are really healthy. So they started databasing them. Let's take, let's start and follow them for many years and get a database. And the nice thing is the Seventh-day Adventists wanted to be studied. Now, the interesting thing about the Seventh-day Adventists, they, they fit everything you would want in order to have a good long-term study. When I hear, like, carnivores, like, oh, the Adventist health study is terrible, it blows my mind. You could not get a better prospective study. It's heterogeneous as far as genetics. In other words, there's all kinds of people there. It's not like we're studying just Japanese, right? Where this may, the effect may be genetic, that they live longer. No, we got a bunch of different genes. Number two, they all follow a pretty healthy lifestyle. So they, the Seventh-day Adventists tend to feel that the body is the temple of the soul, that you got to treat the soul with respect. They tend not to drink. They tend not to smoke. They tend to exercise, and that tends to be pretty pro prominent across the entire population. The interesting thing is they interpret the Bible differently as to how plant-based they need to be. Now, all of them eat a lot more plants than the average person. But some of them are semi-vegetarian. They will eat some meat. Some of them are lacto-ovo-vegetarian. Some of them are pesco-vegetarian. And some of them are vegan. And it's the largest vegan population that we've... I think it's something like 4 or 5% of the total database is vegan, which is huge as far as vegan is concerned, especially going back that many years. And we've had good long-term studies on this. And they're very well controlled. And I read the book, which is an interesting book. It would probably be boring to other people. But um, the guy who really started the study, Frazier, he talked about like the, just how in-depth their studies were. Like They sent their data out to a non-biased review. I mean, they were so careful about the way their data is. And when you look at that study, there's a clear benefit towards a vegan diet, whether you're looking at body mass index or whether you're looking at diabetes or heart disease. Pesco vegetarian competes very strongly with that and in overall longevity there's a slight though not statistical advantage to pesco vegetarian probably because of the omega-3s I, I would guess and of course you could supplement that on a vegan diet but they weren't. Now the pesco could it be that they were more health oriented as well? It could be yeah so the pesco you might say they were doing for health reasons not just you know, ethics. for ethics, yeah. That could be it. It could be that the omega-3 was having a factor. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. Um, the advantage is small to negligible. I, I don't think there's a huge advantage over pescatarian or vegan. Um, I do think vegan should supplement omega-3, uh, but from other smaller studies. Um, and you could supplement that with algae so you don't have to break any moral codes. So that's one thing. Is that, that's studying vegans. The other thing is studying healthy lifestyle patterns. And there's been a million of these kind of studies. So these are a little bit more... It's hard to look at a bunch of different people because everybody eats so differently. So we've started looking... We used to look at macronutrients, but macronutrients are pretty worthless to look at. Comparing low-carb to low-fat... You know, I, I was looking at this one study uh, from a guy who's, you know, Atkins board gets all this money from Atkins and you know he was trying to show that low fat was better than low carb. There's this thing called p-hacking 
Um, and what p-hacking is or p-phishing is you just you set up a study and you look at a million different variables and you find the one variable that happens to have a statistical significance and then your whole paper becomes about that one variable which is not what you should be doing. You should set a hypothesis and test the hypothesis. But this is clearly what he did in the study. Let's take a group of low carb, low fat, let's look at a bunch of different things, let's try to find that thing. And the only thing they could find significant was that the LDL size increased and a, a, a increased size of an LDL particle is not as bad for your health. Well, that's stupid. That's all the difference that they found in all of that. Uh, that's ridiculous. But then when you look at what the, the low fat people were eating, it was junk. I mean, junk food, marshmallow fluff for lunch, uh, turkey, bacon. I mean, it was like really not a healthy diet. So you set up these people to fail, right? So these whole low carb, low fat diet competitions basically came up null. So Christopher Gardner was like, I'm gonna end this debate on low carb versus low fat. And he did a one year study, it was, intensive, they made sure it was a healthy low fat diet and a healthy low carb diet. So the low carb people weren't eating like, you know, beef jerky sticks. They were actually eating healthy, healthier meats. Uh, the low fat diet wasn't eating a bunch of marshmallow fluff, right? Um, and in the end, there was no difference between the low fat and the low carb group. There was zero difference. They, they did equal, equally well. The, and looking at protein, uh, varying protein levels, uh, there was the pounds loss study. It didn't make a difference. It, macronutrients do not make a difference given a certain calorie level. They just don't. So looking at macronutrients doesn't work very well. So let's look at dietary patterns. Now that has been a much better look. And so what they do with dietary patterns is they look at individual studies with certain food groups and do they have a positive or negative value? And there's even, you could go as far as, there's been like the Dietary Inflammatory Index where they've tested different foods to see what inflammatory effect each food has. And they'll do studies, so like the fruits tend to be anti-inflammatory in studies, tend to be associated, you know, people that eat fruits tend to be associated um, with lower heart disease and cancers or certain cancers. Um, and so they look at these different foods, legumes are associated with health. They tend to always include lean meats uh, I could debate whether or not they should increase that, but uh, include that. But they take all this together to say this is a healthy food pattern. Or they might even say, they might even look at a region like the Mediterranean and say Mediterranean diet is associated with longevity and less heart disease. And so let's look at what is entailed in a, in a Mediterranean diet and let's give points for each of those things. So like beans get a certain amount of points or legumes. Uh, grains get a certain amount of points. So then what they do is they take a big database like the nurses, um, Harvard's Nurses Health Study or the Health Profession Study at Harvard. That's a huge database. Let's look at their diet. Let's grade people based on their Mediterranean score or on their... A healthy eating score, which we're gonna give certain points to some foods and take away points for other foods. And then we could get like patterned eating behavior. And does that patterned eating behavior associated with longevity and less cardiac morbidity and mortality and cancer? And that's been really interesting studies because that kind of gives us a little bit easier way for a doctor to say, this is what you should be eating. Telling a patient to eat low fat or low carb is ridiculous. But telling them you should eat a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet, uh, and what is in a DASH diet are these different foods, and these are what you should be aiming for. That's a lot easier for a physician or a dietitian to tell a patient. And that's where we're kind of moving now, is towards these dietary patterns associated with health, which are much more, uh, um, I, they're much more nuanced. There's much less, um, you know, it's not like diehard vegan uh, and it's not carnivore, right? It's a real scientific study looking at, uh, you know, randomized controlled trials, epidemiology, mechanistic studies to come up with a healthy eating pattern. That, not just a healthy eating pattern. The funny thing about the DASH diet, so it started in Harvard, it was a diet for hypertension. Now the funny thing about the DASH diet is it really started with the idea that vegetarians at least if you believe the, the lore that goes with this whole thing. And, um, you know, people at Harvard may argue that 
uh, some of this is myth, but the, the myth is that the original author, the DASH diet, noticed that vegetarians tended to have the lowest blood pressure and they were looking at certain things in vegetables like glutamic acid that gets converted to glutathione that actually brings down blood pressure. And so he was like, well, it seems like a vegetarian diet is the ideal diet for bringing down blood pressure, but we can't tell America to eat a vegetarian diet. They won't do it. So let's come up with a diet that's almost as healthy or maybe as healthy, uh, but is palatable to most of America. And that's where the DASH diet comes in. It's a little bit patronizing, but at the same time, I'm telling you, because I treat patients all the time, that if I give them a 100% plant-based diet and say, this is what you gotta do or else you're gonna fail, or I give them a DASH diet, they're much more likely to stick to a DASH diet. I have seen where they've done studies and the people that in the experiment were doing 100% plant-based after the study kind of stuck with it because they, they they did. So that happened with the broad study. So the broad study is one of the, one of the better studies with weight loss. And they took a group of people and they said, you could eat any of these plants as much as you want, no calorie restriction whatsoever. And it was supposed to be a six month diet. And they did fantastic. It was one of the most weight loss in a non-calorie restricted diet in the literature. Um, there's been some better weight losses in some studies, but they were calorie restricting. Like you can't eat more than this. With these people, eat as much as you want, but it's just food. And they did very well with their weight loss. They, it was supposed to be a six month study, but they went back to check on those people a year later and a lot of them were still doing the diet because they were so happy with the diet because I'm never hungry. And when I am, I eat a lot and I feel great and full and energetic. And so that's how they were feeling and they were sticking with the diet. You know, we're talking about what is practical for people to implement. And I know a lot of physicians are extremely busy and they have limited time with their patients. Do you ever utilize health coaches as like an intermediary? Well, I'm different. So speaking to me and speaking to someone else is different because my clinic is designed around food. So I've got multiple dietitians, I've got behavioral therapists, I've got a nurse practitioner who specializes in diet. So my clinic's different. So obviously, I mean, I don't need a health coach. I've got all these different professionals. But I think a health coach is a great idea. Um, dietitians could be expensive. I, I'm going to, there's good dietitians, there's bad dietitians, there's going to be good health coaches and bad health coaches. A dietitian is going to tend to be better trained than a health coach. I don't know what I'm getting when I get a health coach. I mean, they don't really have a degree per se. So I'm going to tend to want a dietitian in my office. So I want to set the idea. Like I'm telling you, look, here's the literature. A plant-based diet tends to do extremely well. A DASH diet does extremely well. But I can't sit there and plan your meal with you. I'm going to turn you over to my dietitian to do the actual meal planning with you. And that's a little, that's kind of pricey though, you're saying? I, I mean, it can be. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be done in one office. I mean, for me to own a dietitian, I mean, the hospital owns me and the dietitian, so uh, I don't have to worry about it. Uh, I'm an employee and they're an employee. Uh, in a private practice office, it'd be hard to employ a dietitian, but a lot of them now are. They're you know, working on contract, but you could always get a separate dietitian. So you could go to your doctor and they're like, look, I think you've got high blood pressure. A DASH diet would be a great diet for you or a Mediterranean diet. And then you go to a dietitian and say, I need help designing a Mediterranean diet. So I'm wondering about like food deserts. There's growing concern about food deserts. And I'm wondering if there's something we could, something we could recommend. Yeah, I mean, food deserts are a real problem. I mean, if you look at like, there's like great data on obesity and zip codes and certain zip codes just have much more obesity than other zip codes, they can be right next to each other. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. And you know, food deserts and socioeconomic factors are always gonna be a problem. And when you have a government that tells you to eat a plate that is pretty healthy, right? The, the plate is like a quarter protein. They do now say that protein could be plant protein, a quarter fruits, a quarter vegetables, and a quarter grains. Healthy diet. If you ate that plate, everybody would be healthy. No one's eating the government food plate. And the reason they're not eating the government food plate is the government doesn't support the food plate. Because when we have food bills, they give most of their money not to fruits and vegetables, but to meat, dairy, eggs, uh, and simplified grains. A cheeseburger should cost $15, but it's heavily subsidized by taxpayers, so it's 99 cents. Single mom working two jobs and you could drive through and get a meal for your whole family for five bucks. Hard to compete with that. And so in order to compete with that, we've got 
to change the way we fund different foods and provide these different foods. A food desert is gonna be a problem. It's very hard for me to tell patients, you know, and the thing is, the other thing is we need education because the foods I'm telling people to eat aren't expensive. Like I'm telling people to eat what's clinic, which classically has been called a peasant diet. Because when you look at a lot of these blue zones and places in the Mediterranean areas, these aren't rich, wealthy areas. Well, they can be, but even in the rich, wealthy areas. So if you look at Sardinia, for instance, one of the blue zones in the Mediterranean, typical Mediterranean diet. If you look at the coastal villages in Sardinia, they don't have the same health that the mountainous areas have. The mountainous areas are not getting the tourist flow. They don't have the money. They're eating the more traditional diet that is based on legumes and grains and vegetables that they grow. Um, and when they use goat's milk, their own little goat. And so it, it's very different than what the, the other areas are eating. And so this kind of stuff, I mean, eating beans and grains and rice is very cheap. You just need to learn how to be able to do it. So there are ways to teach people in a food desert how to eat a healthy diet that isn't expensive. But a lot of people, like patients in a, people that, that come from these food deserts tend to have never gotten the education about how to make a healthy diet that's cheap. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Food for Life and uh, mm -hmm. by the Physicians Committee? Yeah. And then of course there's the Cornell certification. These are just cert certifications though. Yeah. And well, Food for Life is a cooking class. I'm Food for Life certified. Oh, cool. And that's just, you know, how to teach people to cook these diets and it's fun. It's, it, I, I taught it for a while for my patients. They loved it. They thought it was fun. This is hard for me to do it. Um, it takes a lot of effort to cut up all the food and teach all the classes. Um, E. Cornell is just like a, it's a pretty basic kind of nutrition. People do the E. Cornell class and think that they can then, that they're then a dietitian or nutritionist. Yeah, and they're yeah. not, but it does, it's good, interesting information on health that you could get through there. So, and then, you know, then there's the nutritarian one and there's all these other yeah. ones. And so, if, if, is there something like if somebody wanted to help a food desert and they, you know, I think food for life would be great. Yeah. Yeah, so like getting a getting some kind of idea of how to teach people how to cook, mm -hmm. and then going into that area and teaching—that's fantastic. That's a real service. It takes effort. I'm curious about like your knowledge about the mechanism of action here. Now, I sent you a video a long time ago, but it was on sialic acids, and it was just so intriguing to me because it really delved into the mechanism of actions. I find too many people that uh, that get too bogged down in mechanisms that really don't need to be. It, it, it gets too complicated because the problem with mechanistic studies is you could have a mechanistic study. Like let's take this plant paradox idiot. He's telling you that legumes are bad for you unless you take his legume blocking pill and then legumes are fine for you. Okay, so he's basing that on mechanistic studies showing that lectins in certain foods will bind um, nutrients. Mechanistically, it sounds like a good argument. In fact, he wrote a whole book on it that has convinced people that these foods are bad for you. But what about in the real world? Well, in the real world, in some really good meta-analyses, legumes are the number one predictor of longevity. Number one predictor of longevity. So the food he says is gonna poison you and kill you through mechanistic studies actually makes you live longer. So mechanistic studies are crazy to look at. The other things they could, they, they might prove right in one study and then prove wrong in another. So mechanistic studies are complicated. Now you're probably thinking, if you're talking about silex, silicic acids, you might be thinking about new 5 gc Yes. Yeah, so new 5 gc is interesting, but it, we're really all on theory, right? So the theory in new 5 gc think about the COVID and COVID vaccine. There is a spike protein that the vaccine puts so that you express the spike protein in certain cells so that you then get an immune response to that. Animal proteins tend to have an original type protein on it called new 5 gc that we do not express in human cells, though they have found that if you eat animal protein, you can express this new 5 gc And then it becomes like a vaccine. You're expressing this and you're getting an immune response to it. And could that new immune response have an effect with cancer or with autoimmune disease. And that's theory right now. And there's some good theory and, you know, 
mechanistic studies, but it's way too early to extrapolate that to meat causes cancer. Yeah. I mean, it was just essentially saying it causes inflammation. Yeah. Or Be, well, the, the yeah. immune response is going to cause inflammation. Yeah, yeah. Because right. you start attacking yourself. Right. It, it, to me, it was like really intriguing. Um, it's intriguing, but I would, I would hesitate. And it, it's in my book, but it's a small paragraph in my book. It's like this big. because It's an interesting concept, but it's not ready for prime time. Well, what's, what, what is? Anything in particular? Well, there's a lot. Fiber. Mm -hmm. um, microbiome's really growing in, in, in what's ready for prime time. Specifically, diversity in your microbiome, which is definitely, we know, uh, facilitated by a variety of vegetables uh, and grains and different fibers, Anti certain antioxidants. I don't think taking antioxidants, but, you know, phytochemicals and stuff you get in berries and things like that. Um, I think these concepts, what's really ready for prime time is the concept of like a basic, what what is entailed in a healthy diet? What are these dietary patterns they're seeing in the Harvard uh, studies and in the UK biobank studies and these different kind of big, large epidemiologic and the epic database studies. And what we're finding is the things that you keep hearing, more fruits, more vegetables, more legumes, less meat, dairy, and eggs. And that's, that's what you're going to hear over and over again in these really large, complex studies. What are the leading health organizations that we should be looking at and happen to support a plant-based diet? Um, well, okay. So that are going specifically a plant-based diet is going to be like to support a specifically plant-based diet you're going to see that in the american college of lifestyle medicine which has been a growing group that group has been getting a lot bigger they focus on lifestyle so they're focusing on sleep stress exercise diet and not doing tobacco and, and things like that. The diet they recommend is predominantly plant-based. They don't say vegan or vegetarian, but they say whole food plant-based. But for real medical society, I'm not to say that ACLM is not a real medical society, but it's not one of the leading medical societies. The American College of Cardiology came out with a statement on nutrition that is just as about as comprehensive as you can get with some of the top researchers in the field of nutrition contributing to that, let's call it white paper on nutrition. And the diet they recommend is essentially, without using the words, whole food plant-based. I mean, they don't say that, but there's, it's definitely going towards a predominantly plant-based diet. And that is from the American College of Cardiology with a ton of references as to how they came up with the recommendations and with just top scientists assigned to it. That's so interesting. Uh, Kim Kim Williams was quoted. I don't know if you if you referenced that quote or not. You know that uh, you know there's cardiologists that that are vegan, and then there's the ones that haven't read the data or something. Yeah, I've seen that quote. I, I'm surprised Kim said that. I don't know if he, I've never asked him. Did he really say that? And does he still believe that? I don't. You don't have to be vegan. Again, to me, vegan. I'd kind of like to take the name vegan out of the whole health discussion because vegan is an ethical stance. Mm -hmm. Yes, a vegan diet is healthy, supplemented correctly, because mm -hmm. you gotta take B12, I think you ought to take omega-3s. So a vegan diet, very healthy, well, we know that. So if you wanna be vegan, very healthy. It could be very unhealthy. I don't know what people are eating on a vegan diet. So to say, like someone who's eating vegan ice cream and vegan uh, burgers and vegan pizzas, is that going to prevent heart disease? No. So to say there's, you know, you need to be vegan in order to get your heart disease away, I disagree with that. But a cardiologist better know the problem with saturated fat, and they better know the benefits of plant sterols, fiber, um, phytonutrients, and uh, monounsaturated fatty acids when it comes to um, heart disease and more and more do. And that's what that statement was all about. Yeah. So I personally, I went into advocacy because of the health. I was a closet vegan for five years and then I realized the a closet <laughs> vegan. <laughs> for like, yeah. Then all of a sudden it was like, Oh wow, this nutritional science is so in compelling and interesting. And then I fell in love with like what Gregor was saying and all that. And, and then I was, I got to get the message out there. And, and personally I had, I had run-ins with some of the ethical vegans because I was so health-oriented that, 
that they kind of took offense to it almost in the beginning. Right. Yeah. Well, because because their idea, and you see this, right? I, I've seen vegans, and then they always do that YouTube that always comes out where they got the video, I'm no longer vegan <laughs> because my PR and my bench press went down or something stupid, right? Yeah. Uh, or my, I just don't feel good, whatever it is that they come up with. And the thing about that is a true vegan would almost be a martyr when it comes to, even if the diet wasn't the best for you, you would still be vegan because you're doing it for the animals, right? Or you're doing it for the environment. There's an ethical reason. And if it's ethical, you're willing to die by the sword. And so if you're calling yourself vegan for health, the implication there is if your health started faltering, you would no longer be vegan. And so you're not really doing it for the animals. You're doing it for yourself. And there's a benefit to the animals, but that's not vegan, that, 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 that self-interest. I would say I'm pretty much vegan. I, if my health was, like for instance, I'm gonna take B12. Like, now some people are like, if I have to take any supplement, it's not a healthy diet to me. I think that's kind of silly. Uh, I'm gonna take omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, well, you're but supplementing, we, therefore. But we don't even know if that's necessary. Yet. We don't even know if that's necessary. <laughs> yeah, it's, we're not sure. I, I lean towards it yeah. being good, but we don't. Is it necessary? No, you're gonna live a long, healthy life without it but you might live longer, healthier. Um, if it was affecting my health slightly, I would probably still be vegan because of the ethics standpoint. If it was absolutely affecting my health to like the nth degree, I probably wouldn't be vegan. So, I mean, there's- You just do oysters or something. Yeah, now, so, like, so oysters are an interesting thing, yeah. right? I don't really have a problem with oysters. I've had oysters during my veganism yeah, yeah. because they fit my three criteria, all right? They're healthy by all, Intense. They're, they're, if you're going to eat an animal protein, they are an animal. So technically, they're not vegan. It's stupid to have the conversation. They're in the animal kingdom. They're not vegan. But they fit my three criteria because they tend to be healthy. And you could get some things that you're not getting in your plant-based diet out of oysters. Mm -hmm. They tend to be healthy unless they're dirty. Then you could really mess yourself up uh, because they are filter feeders. Number two, they're good for the environment. Like, actually, good. Things like scallops and stuff are not really good because they dredge for them. But with oysters, they actually grow them in areas and they do filter the water. Uh, and they do actually clean the water. And they're very uh, renewable and it's easy to do these oyster farms. And so th they tend to be good for the environment. And number three, I don't think they're sentient creatures. I just don't. I think they everything is a, yes, you can see the pod come out to eat something, but I think it's all chemical reaction. There's no central nervous system. So I've got no problems with someone eating oysters. Now, here's the thing about about the whole health and stuff like that. So personally, I was a closet vegan because I was ethical and I didn't know if it was going to be healthy or not. Right. And I was going to tell people, to, hey, go vegan. Right. Even though it's going to kill you. And that's why I never bring veganism into the office, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to sit across from a person and talk about veganism yeah, because, yeah. I, you know, I, I need to be sure that about my recommendations from my health standpoint. And you don't know how they're going to implement it. Exactly. So when I became an advocate... And I've evolved to this point where I am now, interviewing so many different doctors and people and all that. You know, I've come to the conclusion that the ethics should encompass humans in the equation there. And That's a good point. When we do what's healthiest for us, we're also doing what's healthiest for everything. Because you know, if we're eating unprocessed foods, there's no packaging, there's no resources. It's way less invasive to other creatures. To me, the, the ultimate highest standard of veganism is eating whole plant exclusively. Yeah, and I would say that's a great ideal. It's just hard in the real world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm pretty strong with my ideals, but uh, man, I'm probably tonight going to go and get a Beyond Burger because yeah. it's late and I've been working all day. So, uh, you know, it's, yes, that is ideal. It's just hard to meet those ideals. Really quick about the fatty acids that you went there. I guess we are, well, we don't really need to go there any further because you did make it clear that we about. don't know about whether we need to supplement that or not. No, you know, funny enough, with omega threes, I'm more interested in the neural health than mm -hmm. I am in the cardiac health. Mm -hmm. um, there's more and more studies, you know, sampling omega three from spinal fluids and stuff like that, and omega threes effects on brain size as you age and things like that. There just seems to be more and more, and some people that you know, it's not an area I study that much. The neural, so I'm, I, I. I 
have to defer to people uh, like the shares eyes and uh, they seem to be pushing more towards supplementing with omega threes and so I don't think that has been decided yet. I mean, the, the only supplement we've decided for sure is B12. Uh, that's the only supplement that's been 100. I'm interested in what the nerdy dude in a lab that you've never seen before yeah. is studying and what those results are. So the, the real science, not, not a guy who's vegan who's commenting on it, a guy who's actually going in and doing these studies and what do these studies show? My feeling right now with omega-3s is I don't think it harms mm -hmm. and I think it probably helps and so I recommend it. Would you still feel the same if you were able to eat perfect the whole plant food seeds every time you're eating and I, I, I and maybe I'm even fairly, algae maybe there even are certain people chlorella that, and, oh okay if you're eating that <laughs> stuff you're eating algae you know if you're eating algae and chlorella and all that kind of stuff possibly you wouldn't need a supplement yeah I don't like ground flax seeds are great for you I, I'm just not convinced and there's certain, like they've done these genetic studies, there's certain areas in the world, like there's an Indian population that could turn ALA into EPA and DHA. I don't know that it, if I can do that, and we don't have a test to see if I can do, if I could personally convert ALA to EPA and DHA, I don't know that. I don't know my spinal. The, the that, problem is to get the test that I would need it, I need to do a LP, a lumbar puncture, where they take my, that's not gonna happen. So the index test isn't really? No, index test is not. It's not, worthless. It's pretty worthless. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, I, I, what you, what, what we really need is, first of all, I want to know what the omega three is in my actual brain, in my spinal fluid. Uh, and Rhonda Kirkpatrick, she's shooting for fourteen index of but, omega six to omega three. Uh, an index, uh, omega three index of, of fourteen. Yeah. Well, so like well, that's like dolphin level or something. Yeah. But. But you're saying that she, test she is... Does, oh, I don't think that test is very... Well, we don't have good studies that that test is, is associated with any... Oh, wow. With, 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 with cardiac lung uh, morbidity and mortality or Alzheimer's or dementia. Okay. That's speculation. Again, that's, that's taking mechanistic, and Rhonda does this a lot. That's mechanistic data and extrapolating. The, the, the best in mechanistic data is like this obsession with NMN and NR. All of our cells, like our energy systems, work on something called NAD. And as you age, NAD drops down. Well, some researchers, one of them at MIT and then at Harvard at a lab, and he did some studies on, we're talking unicellular, like yeast, and on some rodents, and showed that if you could give them NMN, a precursor to NAD, you could increase their NAD, and that would prevent aging. That's mechanistic data. That's data starting to look at rodents and you know single cellular organisms, but does not necessarily extrapolate to humans. But you can make some money because you could start a podcast and you could say, "I've got research that if you take my NMN, which is expensive as hell, we are going to cure aging." Now it turns out, after you know years later, we find out that taking NMN, your body pretty much breaks it down before it ever becomes NAD. There have been some studies that show that NMN can increase NAD levels, but a cheap little niacin supplement could do the same, so you don't have to buy these expensive NMN. But the guy who creates that has got podcasts, he's become famous, he's all around, he's on every talk show, uh, you know, still kind of pushing this, thing that he sells that has made him a lot of money and made him a lot of fame. That's the problem with all these mechanistic studies. That does taking NMN actually show that you can increase longevity in a human being? No, 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 not at all. We don't have any data to say that, but people are taking this like crazy. It's a huge business. It's so cool you mentioned that population that can convert, like very well convert omegas. What's cool about that, though, is over hundreds of years, that population they became evolved. more and more efficient. Yeah, they did so, evolve. So I wonder if we're doing ourselves a disservice by supplementing because we're bypassing the, the metabolic pathway there. Uh, that's possible, but evolution happens over a long period of time, and I'm interested in my life right now. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to wait for you know, my ancestors or my, uh, my, my future predecessors' pro progeny to evolve that. I want it now. I'm also very interested in in raising children from conception, actually, vegan from conception, because we know even as far back as our grandparents mm, sure. um, have an effect on us. Right, epigenetics. Yeah, so yeah. 
Maybe we could start supplementing after we've had kids. Sure, yeah, yes, because you're eating whole yeah, plant yeah, foods yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. your body's trying to Yeah, so this. I'm going to give them ALA and it's going to force them to yeah. convert. I don't know the answer to that. Interesting concept. Yeah. Mm. But you, know, you think it's okay to raise kids vegan? Oh, yeah. It's, great. it's fine. It's great. to. I, like, it's so funny to me when you know, I go out to lunch with... Uh, I went out to lunch with a friend of mine and my kids ordered... We were at True Foods. I don't know if you've ever eaten at True Foods. And it was great big crudite. It's, it's an awesome thing of just vegetables, right? And my kids ordered the crudite. And their kids ordered a cheeseburger. And my kids are eating like radish and carrots and uh, broccoli. And he's like, and he says to me, he's like, aren't you worried about your kids' nutrition? While well, his kids are eating a cheeseburger. And I'm just like, oh, my God. I mean, we've got just rampant obesity in children right now. All kinds of vitamin deficiencies in children. You're worrying about vegan children. But again, what does vegan mean? Like, if, if vegan means my kids are eating a bunch of, like, garden chicken nuggets and that's it, that's not going to be healthy. Yeah, then I, if, if they're not supplementing with B12, that could be a serious problem. Now, about B12 real quick, the, uh, I've, I've interviewed a few raw vegans, and they ferment, and they eat a lot of raw foods, and they don't supplement, and their B12 is okay. Is it okay? I don't know. No, That's what it's they not. Say. So they come and see me. A few of them have come and seen the me. The raw ones that yeah. ferment? Yeah. I, one famous one. We won't mention names. No, uh, and her B12 level was like unbelievable. I was like, I called her up. I was like, this is the lowest B12. Did she have symptoms? Well, Possibly. Uh, not the serious type symptoms where you get what's called megaloblastic anemia. And, Did you and check her whole transcobalamin? Or I look, that, yeah, okay. I always check MMA too. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, uh, oh, oh, it was like the kind of... Lo- now, you could be like a carnivore and say, that low B12 doesn't matter at me because X, Y, Z. But all I could tell you is that low of a B12 in studies has been associated with some really bad long-term neurological problems. And I wouldn't want to take that experiment with myself. So easy to take a B12, Jeez. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, one lady that, the one lady that intrigued me, she's 75 years old, 50 years raw, ferments, like it eats fermented food every day. Yeah. Maybe she's evolved some pathway, maybe Yeah, and I've, maybe heard, she's the, fine. I've heard that's possible. Yeah, maybe, I don't, I don't. Look, ancient man got B12, right? Because he was getting it from the dirt. Because it's microbe derived. So, I mean, if you're like picking that carrot out of the ground and you're eating it with the soil in it, you've got a great organic soil going on where you're composting and there's no pesticides on it and you've got a really good bacteria on there and you're eating that carrot, you might easily be able to get enough B12. Um, But that's just not advice I'm going to give to anybody. We've got a mutual friend that doesn't take B12 and she gets it from her well water, she claims. No, it's possible. But I don't want to take that risk either. What else is she getting from that well water? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, so no, no conversation with Garth is, is complete without talking about protein. There's a lot of controversy over whether or not we need 0.8 uh, grams per kilogram of body weight and now people are saying oh we need way more and but of course we know we we're getting way more anyway so well, no you just said it. I that. mean the argument over the RDA is just stupid I mean the RDA kind of stuff mm-hmm. that is relevant if we're talking about third world countries all right if we're talking about someone who uh, you know is in food scarcity how much protein do we need to make sure they make Americans get enough protein. Yeah, the RDA, those were some complex studies they did. And there's people that say, well, nitrogen balance studies can have some inaccuracies. And that's true. Any study could have inaccuracies because they was like, they were like, well, nitrogen studies can have inaccuracies. So let's do amino acid oxidation studies. Those have tons of inaccuracies too. Why is that better than these very complex nitrogen studies they did? But you got to understand the RDA when they set the RDA, the recommended daily allowance, that was two standard deviations over what the average person needed in protein to not go into catabolism, to start breaking down muscle. Because they could tell when you're breaking down muscle based on the nitrogen balance. So to not have a negative nitrogen balance, you needed a certain amount. And they were like, okay, well, we want to make sure that no one has a problem. So let's go two standard deviations above that. So in some terms, you could call that optimal. I mean, it's not a minimum value, uh, but, it, it, but it's the optimal to make sure that everybody gets enough. 
If someone thinks, and a lot of people think this, scientists think this, and I don't understand. So I, I have had conversations with so many intelligent people that do their research that somehow think that how much protein you eat affects sarcopenia. I have looked at this, I have looked at so many studies. If you take a non-exercising individual and you give them 0.8 or you give them 1.2, there's no difference in their muscle mass. There's not. If someone's lying in a bed and you give them different levels of protein, it doesn't make a difference. So number one, from a sarcopenia standpoint that we care about, protein doesn't matter above RDA. If we're talking about RDA and protein, it doesn't matter because everybody's getting over the RDA. So the RDA for a female is 46 grams. The RDA for a male is 56 grams. The average people are getting 80 to 100, sometimes 120, depending on what studies you look at. We're doubling the RDA. So discussing whether the RDA should go up is just a moot point. It's, a, it's mental masturbation. It's ridiculous. It, it, it has no bearing on the average person because everybody's getting enough RDA. So then the question becomes in optimizing your muscle. That's where we, we get to a, a little bit more where you can really split hairs. And the splitting hairs comes in, and I give this analogy and I put this on my social media. I did Iron Man, and I got a fancy bike. It was, it was an aerodynamic, and I wore the special helmet so the air flows over my helmet. And I had special wheels, so there was less air drag on the wheels. And the whole outfit probably cost me $10,000 for my bike and all that helmet and stuff. So how much time did that bike save me over, whether I had gotten a regular old 10 speed or a regular bike helmet and had regular wheels, which would have cost me $1,000. So $9,000 probably got me three, at three minutes, I would say looking at some of the data, three, maybe four minutes. So I finished in 12 hours, 12 hours and six. So I would have, if I'd done it with, uh, without all that stuff, maybe I would have finished, let's even say this is really good aero equipment and I stayed in, the other thing is for all this equipment to work, I would have had to stay in that tuck position perfectly the whole time. As soon as I do this, all my money's wasted. So let's say I did it perfectly. If I hadn't done all that stuff, I would have finished in 12.15. Now, what's the difference between 12.15 and 12.06? Absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. all right? For me to qualify for Kona, which is my ultimate goal, I would have had to do a 10.30, and I did a 12. And 12's good, most people are doing 14, et cetera. So I'm very happy with my time, I'm proud of my time, I ain't anywhere close to 10.30. If you're eating one gram per kilogram protein, and you go to 1.6 grams per kilogram, well, let's start with this. Between 1.6 and 2.2, there really isn't a benefit, all right? So we don't even need that. That's spending money, you don't even need it. So the difference between one and 1 1.6 grams per kilogram is so small. In some studies, it's a little bit more hypertrophy, but not increased strength. There was a couple studies where it showed an increase in strength, but it was like such a, when you look at the absolute increase in strength, it's so small. And my question is, why? Why am I gonna spend so much money on supplements? Why am I, one thing I've seen in vegans, like people that drop veganism, it's because some of them are like, I feel bloated and sick and I start talking to them about, well, I felt like I had to get enough protein in order to compete. And so I'm eating all these protein chicks and I'm bloating. But you don't, what do you, what do you could be, you're getting paid to win a marathon? You're, you're making, you're making such a small difference. Uh, your PR in your bench press is five pounds less than it, it could be. What difference does that make in your life? And this is from a cost standpoint. You don't need that cost, you don't need that bloating. Now that's one argument. The second argument is back to theory. Is it potentially a negative to go higher in protein? And there is a theoretical negative. And this is something that we could really split hairs on. But there is a theory that as you increase, so there's a difference between animal protein and plant protein. You'll hear, you'll hear people say, animal protein's superior because it's got more amino acid. Well, there may be a problem with that more amino acid because it's got more leucine. And leucine is better for muscle protein synthesis. But muscle protein synthesis is purely a mechanistic term. 
Does, muscle pro does a higher muscle protein synthesis mean more muscle mass in a study? And the answer in some studies is no. In other studies, it's yes, but very small. What could be the negative of that leucine that's increasing the muscle protein synthesis? Well, it does stimulate IGF-1. IGF-1 has been associated with prostate cancer. In Mendelian randomization studies, it's been associated with colon cancer. Those are the two major cancers affecting men in America, are prostate and colon. And we know that IGF-1 plays a role in that. And so does having higher IGF-1 become a negative indicator for life? Well, we, this is not proven at all. This is theory. The other thing is that leucine stimulates mTOR. mTOR is an aging path. And now we could get it to FOXO and all this very complicated aging research that is in its infancy. But there is a theory that protein restriction may end up extending lifespan. And so maybe me doing extra not only costs me more, it makes me bloated because I'm trying to stuff protein down, but may actually cost me as far as my health long-term. That I can't prove. That's theory, but the, there is science behind that theory. But I think my main message is to people is like, God, I, so I wanted to experiment it with myself. Again, N of one doesn't mean anything, but I just wanted to experiment it with myself. So I started doing, I probably average, you know, I, I tend towards the protein. Uh, it's not that I'm trying to avoid protein necessarily. I eat tofu, I love tofu, tastes good. So I throw it in my salads and things like that. I eat a lot of legumes. I probably average 80 to 90 grams of protein a day, which is about one gram per kilogram for me. I do athletics. I'm pretty muscular. I, I do very well for my age group in any kind of lift that you want to do. I could go and run a marathon in a month if you wanted to run them. I'm in a really good peak state. Would I be healthier if I ate more? No, I really don't think so. But I thought, okay, let me try. So I'm going to go to 150 grams per kilogram. Is it going to up my lifts? Is it going to up anything? Am I going to notice anything? All I noticed was like bloating because I was having to eat a lot more. I was starting to do shakes. I can't stand protein powders. They just gross me out. I just didn't feel good on it. I mean, I did it for a month. I noticed no, a month maybe not have been long enough. I couldn't stick with it. But that's my point. There's people that are saying, I can't be vegan because I can't stick with this increased protein because I got to get 1.6. Why? That's my question. Why? Show me a study that shows this, this is amazing muscle growth with 1.6 versus 1.1. It just doesn't exist. There's these like small little, oh, they could, their leg press was like a fraction more. Their muscle mass was one kilogram more. And so be like, one kilogram muscle. Look, if you're a bodybuilder and you're competing on a stage, yes, one kilogram muscle mass is, is significant. With me, it's not, yeah, no, I'm not gonna notice it. Remember that twin study? Oh, the two guys that did it? And yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The one guy I got, I think it was four kilograms more muscle mass that, that, that was eating meat. Mm -hmm. And then, then, the, then, the, then the vegan, but yeah. the vegan... Was outperforming him in strength and yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, by the way, that's interesting. Sometimes you could build muscle mass but not build strength, which you would think, if I'm building muscle mass, I must be building strength, but that's not always the case, yeah. And strength tends to be the better predictor, by the way, of when we start looking at long-term studies of health, strength is a better indicator than hypertrophy. Than, but that's a whole other argument. YouTuber, I won't mention his name, no plugs for him, but he interviewed somebody who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, vegan. He's now carnivore, I guess. So he was working out one day and he pulled a muscle or whatever. And he said that his muscles were growing faster than his connective tissue could keep up with. And he was taking all these protein powders and stuff. And I'm thinking, what does it have to do with being like, vegan and healthy or even healthy it's so stupid <laughs> it has nothing to do with eating it doesn't healthy. it doesn't and, and it's so stupid because there's there's there, there's a guy who's eating so much protein and meat who has the same shoulder problem right yeah, exactly it, it, it's just so i hear this stuff all the time it's like someone gets a cold oh it's because you're vegan yeah. you know i see people like they'll have like thyroid issues and the doctor will say well you're having thyroid issues because you're vegan uh -huh. well i'm like what do they tell their meat eaters that have thyroid issues <laughs> You know, it's the dumbest thing. And so in order to do that, you got to actually look at, you know, uh, long-term studies comparing a vegan to, like, do vegans have more thyroid issues than meat eaters? No. They, they know that from the Adventist Health Study. Uh, and so it's the same thing with that. Do vegans have 
more joint disorders. Now, I mean, it may be that vegans have more bone disorders. Um, that's a hard thing. That's because of body mass, right? It could be because of body mass. Um, having a lower body mass, they're putting less pressure on their bones, so they're getting less bone mineral density. Uh, I mean, it, it, it could be a, because a osteoporosis, of for example. I mean, and, and I talked to a fitness person about this recently. You know, the little impacts that you, know, that you make uh, cause little fractures, and it pulls and calcium from your diet, and it builds and more it, dense it bones. It, yeah, yeah. And so, whenever I've talked to a, a vegan who has an osteoporosis, she knows that she had it before. She, she was headed that way anyways because she wasn't exercising. Wasn't exercising. Exercising the like if you're exercising, like my bone mineral density is through the roof. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I check everything myself. My bone mineral density is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I've been vegan for how long now? And I have my bone mineral density is better than I'll I'll put my bone mineral density against anybody. Uh, and my calcium score in my heart is zero. Uh, and you know I don't. So yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, being um, vegan in and of itself is not going to cause bone yeah, disorder. Yeah. And, then, and then I'm curious, protein powders, protein shakes, whatever, uh, are we just peeing out money here? Yeah, I think we're peeing out money. Right. And because, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of vegans pushing their own little... No, oh, they all pushing their own. I, I think we're peeing out money. I think we're wasting money. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's good to know. Um, and I mean, it's a, like there, there's a few, I had a long in-depth discussion with a very smart vegan researcher yesterday, a doctor, uh, and he takes vegan whey protein. And he, you know, and this puts together a nice argument why he does it. First of all, he says it's totally inconvenient for me to make food and to eat these large meals. And I do think I get a benefit at 1.6 versus 1.1. And I need to get it as easy as possible. And you know, we have vegan whey now. Yeah, um, so the new thing is using bacteria, using CRISPR technology to change their genetic, their DNA so that they actually produce, the bacteria produces, we get, we've got vegan collagen and vegan whey. You can make a bacteria produce collagen and a bacteria produce whey. And this vegan whey is actually pretty darn good. It, it has got a very complete protein profile right on par, maybe even, it's got more leucine than regular whey protein. And so, I don't know, for some people there's gonna be that that. And then we gotta worry about that be. theory of it maybe. Let, that's what him and I are arguing about, is yeah. is that extra leucine in that vegan whey risky? And he doesn't think so based on the studies. I think there's at least an argument that it could be, and I've still got the argument that it could be and I still don't think it's helping you that much, so why? Yeah, yeah. And then methionine as well, right? Yeah, methionine, it's the same kind. We're getting into the same kind of thing. So now methionine is interesting in its relation to cancer. Let, and amyloid plaques. Yeah, and amyloid, there's so many complexities. With methionine, the data on methionine causing cancer is not as strong as methionine restriction if you have cancer in conjunction with chemotherapy. So that's where we, that's, that's really the most research we have is that if you have chemo, withholding methionine does seem to make the chemo more effective in some very small studies. Uh, but that's the, just the initial work with methionine. I had this idea when I was learning about amyloid plaques a little bit that, you know, when you sleep, when you go into a deep sleep, your brain gets you clear, you clear yeah. it out. Yeah. I wonder if now a lot of vegans don't tend to sleep as much, and I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if that's less of an issue with us because we're not getting as much methionine. Because I've heard that that can contribute to amyloid plaques. I mean, this is just yeah. me making yeah. up stuff here, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just curious if you had any thoughts on that. But is there anything we didn't talk about that you think would be cool to throw out there? I mean, the only thing that's bothering me lately is this. You say this, but there's a guy who has a YouTube channel that says that. Yeah. Who am I to believe? I just would caution people, like I mentioned that American College of Cardiology paper on nutrition and heart disease. That paper is so well thought out and it is filled with references and it's written by the top scientists and it is supported by a huge medical organization. And you can't say that because one person says something and one person says something else, they cancel each other. It's a thousand people saying one thing and one person saying the other. And so this, you know, this is the problem, like you'll have a debate online and you know, you'll have someone talking about Mediterranean diet and someone talking about carnivore. And it seems like well, you got two people that have equal pull, they both must be right. That's not true. 
And there is a hierarchy of science, right? There's an idea that certain science is better than other science. First of all, anecdotes useless, which is all you get out of carnivores. I mean, anecdotally saying you feel better, or this, that, and the other, or an N of one, useless. Oh, I did this and my acne cleared up, useless, all right? That's useless. In order to build an argument, you should have mechanisms, but you should not rely exclusively on mechanistic studies. You should have epidemiology that's very well controlled and prospective, not cross-sectional. These are all big terms, which may confuse some of your listeners. And if it does, don't worry about it. Suffice it to know that just because someone tells you there's a paper and just because some uh, keto person's got a paper doesn't mean it's equal to a large paper by a large medical society by the top scientists that have gone through tons of different papers, both pro and con for whatever they're saying, and have come up with a position statement. It, it, it's two different worlds. And I think that's a real issue I'm having lately. The other issue is that it's very easy to, if you don't understand science, to be duped by it. Um, for instance, there was this, and this is the famous, for instance, which is the Siri Torino study. And this was a study looking at saturated fat and heart disease. Because it's really inconvenient for animal industry to have saturated fat be blamed. The complexity came back in the 1960s and 1970s because the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition was meeting and their, their original calling was to answer malnutrition in America. But they found that there really wasn't people getting under nutrition. The real problem was the growing obesity and cardiac health epidemic. So they did a lot of research and they had all kinds of people come speak and it was the, they had these hearings and these hearings were very heated. And their final conclusion is we need to eat less meat, dairy, and eggs. That was not palatable to the industry. And in fact, this was called the McGovern Committee. And the funny thing about the McGovern Committee is that McGovern was from North Dakota, big meat place. Well, when this came out, they made sure he was voted out right away. And they got the, you know, one of the recommendations was eat less meat, and they got that recommendation changed to eat more lean meat. And that's where we started talking about low fat. That's where the term, let's not talk about, let's not demonize a food group was what the industry said. But you could say, let's demonize fat. Well, that was great because you could make snack wells that are low fat and sell a million. The meat industry could stay in the ball game because they could have low fat. You could have skim milk and low fat milk and all this stuff. And so that's where we started with this whole low fat, low carb. It started the low fat craze, but we never went low fat. Like during the low fat craze, we actually ate more fat. That's something people don't seem to know. They're like, low fat never worked. Well, it never worked because we never did it. As time went on, we got a little bit more sophisticated and we started seeing that saturated fat was really the problem, right? It wasn't that it was fat in general. Monounsaturated fats weren't that bad for you, maybe even beneficial for your heart, but saturated fat was the problem. Well, this is inconvenient for an animal industry because now we say we can't demonize animal proteins and all that kind of stuff, but we can't say, you know, meat's bad for you, eggs are bad for you. But if we're saying saturated fat is bad for you and saturated fat only comes from animals, that's a problem. So if we could get it so that we could say saturated fat is not bad for you, now we're in the money. The problem is, is that there were intricate ward studies in hospitals done at Harvard by a very famous researcher named Hegstead. Now you feed someone a certain amount of saturated fat, their LDL cholesterol went up in a very linear fashion. Now, each person may have a different response, but with that person, the more saturated fat you get, the more your, your LDL increases. There's no question that saturated fat increases LDL. It may be to different degrees to different people, but in each individual person, it's gonna elevate their LDL a certain amount. So we know saturated fat increases LDL. Now, do we know that LDL increases lead to heart disease. Absolutely, we know it. I, th this idea that LDL doesn't lead to heart disease, that high LDL isn't associated with heart disease is absolutely ludicrous. I hear this from the carnivore people all the time. We've got Mendelian randomization studies, which Mendelian randomization is very difficult to explain, but there are certain people that genetically are predisposed to low LDL. Do they get heart disease? No, that should tell you something. Then if you increase someone's LDL does that associate with heart disease. One of the best studies was the Cooper study uh, done out of the Cooper Clinic in Dallas. A huge study, all right? 30,000 people 
followed up to 30 years. They looked at 10-year morbidity and mortality data. The interesting thing about their randomization was they made sure that everybody was age mat, weight match, not smoking, not drinking, and did not have any other predisposition but to towards heart disease. In other words, there was no other metabolic illness. This was, they, they didn't have insulin resistance. They didn't have hypertension. These are healthy people, but they've got varying degrees of LDL. And if your LDL was above 160 versus below 120, you had a 60% increased risk of cardiac mortality at 10 years. 60%, that is off the charts. You don't even have to ask about significance. In 30,000 people, over 30 years worth of death, this is a great, this, that should be it. That should be the, all the discussion you need. Mendelian randomization, studies and the Cooper study, and that should be all you need, but we got even more than that. We've got studies on LDL lowering with the drugs and pharma. We, there's so many studies. LDL definitely associated with heart disease. Saying it isn't is just stupid, all right? So the Siri Torino is a meta-analysis of different studies, and they concluded that saturated fat is not associated with heart disease. And that took off, right? If saturated fat isn't associated with heart disease. How did they conclude that? Right, how did they conclude that? So this is the thing, if you are, and it was published in a prominent journal. Now, if you are an unsuspecting person on the internet and you see someone say, saturated fat isn't associated with heart disease, here is a major study that showed this. You're like, wow, Dr. Davis is friggin' wrong. Okay, but you don't know how to read the study. So there's a lot of things that go into making a study. The famous thing, and Jeremiah Stamler, who's one of the, like, he is one of the lead lipid researchers ever, and he published an article on this in New England Journal of Medicine. The problem was what's called over-adjustment bias. And understand that the people that wrote this article, <laughs> just because you have conflicts of interest doesn't mean that you can't do a good study, but every single one of them had a conflict of interest. And you could tell that this affected the result because if you just look at their antics ever since that study, but also because of this over-adjustment bias and not mentioning it. So what over-adjustment bias is, is they said, we're looking at saturated fat and heart disease. And we want to know if saturated fat affects heart disease. So in order to do that, these different studies in the meta-analysis, and they said in order to do that, we need to eliminate any other risk factor that could contribute to heart disease, so that we're just looking at saturated fat and heart disease. So what do you then control for? You control for cholesterol. So anybody with a high LDL is taken out of that statistical analysis. So you understand how stupid that is? So you're basically taking out the causal effect of saturated fat to heart disease, because saturated fat causes high LDL, which causes heart disease, but you're removing all those people where saturated fat put that LDL into a dangerous level that could cause heart disease. So obviously saturated fat will not be associated with heart disease in such a situation. But that's complex analysis of science that the average person couldn't possibly do. And yet that study was huge in affecting the way people eat and how influencers affect people on social media. There was another study, it's just amazing how people could massage data uh, or, or set up studies. So they set up a study. So the study that they wanted to do was look at whether eggs increase cholesterol. They had two different diets and one had more eggs in it. But in the diet with the eggs, they actually decreased the amount of saturated fat in that diet. So they were giving them more eggs, but they were decreasing their saturated fat through other foods. Oh, okay. So the control group actually ate more saturated fat than the egg group. Oh, wow. Well, saturated fat, like I told you, is the strongest mm -hmm. control of LDL. So yeah, the control group is gonna have a higher LDL than the egg group. So it's gonna look like the egg group, like eggs, dropped the LDL level, but eggs did. Yeah, the funny thing about like the carnivore keto type people, they're like, epidemiology is terrible. Until they could find an epidemiology study, like the Siri Torino study I just told you, then they, that's their number one study. And they're like, you vegans cherry pick, and yet I've never seen anybody cherry pick like a carnivore person. They would cherry pick the hell out of it. I mean, 
only cherry pick. They never look at the, like I look at all, that's why I'm like, you, you've heard me during this interview, be cautious to ever say vegan diet is the only way to, I like look at the totality of all of the science. I'm not looking at any specific, I, um, I use Adventist Health Study a lot because it is the best epidemiologic study looking at vegans. There's no really the good database that's going to follow them as well as they have in a prospective manner. You know, I like to also throw out there, you know, side of these studies, we've got things like True North and Hippocrates Wellness and, you know, so many different doctors who've been doing this for decades and decades and longer than, than any of these fad diets can stay in existence. And, and, they, and they've worked with tens of thousands of people, some of these guys. Like, I think McDougal's probably worked with over 10,000 people. You know? Yes, McDougal's worked with a lot of people. A lot of, by, a lot of people swear by it. But again, uh, it's good, and I'm glad we have that kind of data. But to me, again, that's still anecdotal. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, for me to make a decision... But I, they, I, they I, seem to have a little more clout than somebody like a, like Dr. Baker, who's... No, Dr. Baker's got no clout. Yeah, you can't, comp you can't compare McDougal to Baker. But there are keto doctors that do have their own set of evidence and stuff that can be compelling in a certain, I don't know, if you, have you heard of Verda Health? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, so um, Ver, Verda Health, they've got, they've got good science and they make a good argument and I could argue with their findings and, and why, what, what's wrong and stuff with it, but they do make a good argument, as good, even maybe better than McDougal would make on his own, just because they've kept better data. Yeah, but now, what about, don't they rate Diets. It's this U.S. World of News report that rates diet. Is that is that legit by any chance? I, it's not scientific. They take you know experts in the field that rate diets in different kind of categories. It's, I wouldn't call it a scientific analysis. They said the keto was like way down there. That was U.S. World of News report. Uh, keto was yeah. at the bottom. Yeah. Is there anything out there that's scientific in rating these diets? Well, there's the dietary dietary inflammatory index. Mm -hmm. And you can look at just what foods are inflammatory by the Dietary Inflammatory Index, and that'll give you a good idea of what foods are inflammatory and what aren't. How do the ketos respond to that? I don't, I've never really heard them respond to it. Uh, uh, they just kind of like, just, you know, because guess how all their foods compare on yeah, the Dietary yeah, Inflammatory yeah. Index. Um, but I think that the healthy food pattern eating is what people should be looking at. I mean, the one thing, like the U.S. World of News report that put keto so low put DASH number one. Uh, and Mediterranean way up there, and for it, uh, heart health Ornish. And so... Uh, that seems pretty legit to me. Yeah, that's pretty legit. And so, uh, no, I think like a, for a person who's like, not gonna be like, I'm vegan, uh, but wants to eat a healthy diet, I think looking towards DASH and flexitarian and, and uh, Mediterranean diets, it's a good way to go. A good way to start, at least. It's a good way to start. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you were talking about large bodies of evidence. Now, I like to look at the Institute of Medicine a little bit. I think they're still called the Institute of Medicine. Yeah, Institute um, of Medicine, yeah. I, I noticed, like, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range for carbohydrates on the low end is higher than protein and fat on the high end. Yeah, don't worry about that. Like, you could go zero carb and live, right? We know that. Yeah, but, um, I mean, but they're not going to recommend that. They're not going to recommend that. Yeah, and they also recommend increasing fiber, decreasing saturated fat. So yeah, they're making I mean, good recommendations, right? They're making good recommendations. But yeah. that acceptable, I mean, there's a lot of arguments over their acceptable ma daily macronutrients. That's a little bit, that's uh, apt for a lot of argument in the field. They've got like such a wide range of protein in that. Um, it, it's kind of, you know, 15 to 35%, I think it is. It's just, it's like an insane difference. Which, whereas I think 10 to 12% is probably fine. Um, but it depends on how many calories you eat. It's so, the, so the cardiology one you mentioned is, mm -hmm. is, is about as legit as it is. Is as legit as you're going to get. <laughs> cool, cool. You got a favorite quote or any quotes you'd like to share? The problem we have is that we're fed by a food industry that doesn't care about health and treated by a health industry that doesn't care about food. I, I'm, I'm very concerned that we have food producers that just don't care what our health is. They just want to sell more of their food. And we've got a healthcare industry that is really not healthcare at all. It is sick care. Most of what I do every day is treating illnesses caused by the food that we eat. And both of those need to come together uh, with the help of the government so that we're funding food appropriately as it, is, as it uh, relates to health. Yeah. 
you know, that makes me, I can't help but think of like, you know, Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, things like that, you know, um, of course they've got their place, I guess, but, you know, a lot of people think those are specifically for vegans, but you go to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or a Burger King and they put cheese on it and all that, so obviously it's not for vegans. It's not vegan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, those things, look, um, those things, they're cheaper than raising meat. They're cheaper than um, we don't need food. So we, they don't need the subsidies you get to the, the, to the cattle industry uh, when they have a drought and stuff like that. Could, you know, the, recently the milk industry has done terribly and would probably be out of business except for government bailouts. Uh, but when we're using soy milk and oat milk and all these things, you're not going to need that. And yes, almond milk takes a lot of water, but nothing like dairy milk does. People don't seem to know. Oh, almond takes water. Yeah, but do you know what it takes to raise a cow? Only tons of water. Um, so, I mean, I think the, those foods, and there was a study looking at, um, I don't know if it was Beyond or Impossible versus a regular burger, and it did end up being healthier than a regular burger because it's got lower saturated fat, but it's not as healthy as a bowl of beans and rice and vegetables. But it is, you know, I use Beyond Meat and all these things. I use them all the time. I use it for palatability in some of my foods I make. I might, you know, put some in with this and put some in with that. And you're not just eating that without I'm the bun. I'm not just eating that. Your book, is it still, is it still to you valid? Proteinaholic? Yeah, I think proteinaholic is still valid. In fact, I think the evidence is kind of come out even more towards my book. I would add stuff into my book now. I think the thing that might be, I was a little more uh, overzealous, I think, in the book than I would be now. I'm a little bit more nuanced now than I was then. I was sure about things. I was a little bit more into mechanistic studies there. So, you know, I would be like, you know, if you interviewed me right when I was doing all that research, I'd be like, new 5GC, IGF-1. Ah, mTOR, definitely. Now I'm like, still believe those are factors. I still think they're things we should look at, but I realize that maybe the science isn't as strong in those areas uh, as I would think. But I, I think there's actually more science to support my book than there, than there ever has been. And Proteinaholic, they could go to your website, they can go to Amazon, and, uh, and they can get that there. I'll be sure to link that in the description, pin the comment, and show a picture of it. And... Uh, Cool. Any other books you're going to write in the future? No. I, right now, I'm done <laughs> writing books. I got a day job. I got to keep doing. You know, to finish this off, you know, I do want to say I really appreciate your time because I know you're busy. Um, you know, I've had to interview some other doctors, and they were extremely busy. You, you were telling me one day you did five surgeries, and one day... I got day four tomorrow. I've got five tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, wow. And you were up. Sometimes you're up in the middle. You get called in the middle of the night or something. And to me, that's just a testament to how hard it is for you to get the message out there and how easy it is for the people to get the message out there that aren't really all that legit, you know, like yeah. they're just out that there. That carnivore MD isn't even really an MD. Like he's got an MD, but he's not a licensed practicing doctor. All he does is make videos. Yeah. I mean, he can't implement what he's preaching. He can't implement because he's not practicing. Right. He's not a practicing doctor. So cool. People can find you on, on your website and I appreciate your time. And I guess we'll call it a wrap. Let's call it a wrap.